In our final video on gene expression, we're going to be concluding our discussion on transcription and translation process specifically by finishing up uh, with translation 3 as our final flowchart. So in translation 2, we were able to establish the idea of ribosomes and their role in terms of their structure small and large subunits, and their sites, the A, P, and E sites. We're going to be applying that information and further continuing our process of translation. We've, continued, we've already done initiation. We've brought the two subunits together. We know that there's an AUG that's been spotted. We've created an initiation complex. Now let's get on to step two, which would be elongation. So step two is elongation. Much like transcription, elongation will be uh, an overall idea of elongating our growing polypeptide chain. More specifically, elongation can be simply considered a series of repeated cycles. It's, just, it's the same thing happening over and over again, so much so that these repeated cycles are going to be necessary in which uh, we're going to have each cycle adding on or adds amino acid to growing PPC, growing polypeptide chain. So that's our whole idea behind elongation. Big overarching theme is that many cycles will continuously add amino acids to a growing polypeptide chain. Now more specifically, we can actually talk about how this is done, and this process is done and catalyzed through a very important enzyme, we'll say done via this enzyme known as peptidyl transferase. Peptidyl TD, TIDYL transferase. Okay, so this is an enzyme. We have an ASE ending. So of course, this enzyme will function in uh, some sort of elongation process. More specifically, this is not just an enzyme, but this is actually a ribozyme. Okay, it's a ribozyme that consists of a lot of rRNA molecules. Because again, let's remember, this is occurring at the ribosome. The ribosome consists of proteins and also rRNA. Remember how I said ribosomal RNA has many catalytic functions? This is one of them. This is going to catalyze the formation of a peptide bond by utilizing a ribozyme, a ribozyme that consists of rRNA as its structural component. So this enzyme is a ribozyme thus because it has this rRNA. Peptidyl transferase, more specifically, is a component of the large subunit, okay, more specifically, component of large subunit, so it's a part of that large subunit, not the small, and its process is pretty simple, but again, very, very important. The process that peptidyl transferase undergoes or does in order to grow the polypeptide chain, because this is our goal, to do many cycles of growth to this polypeptide chain by adding amino acids, what do we do? Well, the following occurs. There's going to be a peptide bond that forms because of peptidyl transferase, thus the name. The peptide bond will be formed between, so BTWN, peptide bond between the amino acid in two separate sites, between the amino acid in the P site and in the A site, okay? So there's going to be a process that's going to catalyze this peptide bond that forms between the A and P site amino acids. There's going to be amino acids in both of them. We're going to combine them together. More specifically, we can state that this combination event, this uh, overall bond forming event, happens at a specific part of the uh, both amino acids, and this actually occurs between the amino group of one of the amino acids. I'll tell you which one. Between the amino group, because an amino acid, of course, has an amino group, and that amino group will be on the new amino acid of new amino acid, and that new amino acid is always found in the A or P site. It's actually always found in the A site if we refer back to our ribosomes, part of our translation flowcharts. Between amino group of new amino acid um, in A, and that's going to be also, so we have an amino group that's going to combine with uh, a separate amino acid, the carboxyl group of the other amino acid. 
So we're going to combine a carboxyl group, I know it's a little squished down here, a carboxyl group um, of amino acid in the P site, okay? So we have a P site and an A site. I told you that a peptide bond forms, but this peptide bond forms specifically between the amino group of a new amino acid and the carboxyl group of the already in place P site amino acid. Please look at a figure or a video that defines this process and shows this process in much more eloquent detail than I can possibly do in this flowchart manner. Finally, in elongation, we're going to have a process known as translocation. So this is the idea of a series of repeated cycles, okay? We've added amino acids through peptidyl transferase, but what we have to do is we have to do translocation. Translocation is when the ribosome itself, and I find this fascinating, this ribosome physically moves down. It actually translocates itself. Ribosome moves down one codon at a time, so one codon on mRNA, because the mRNA is our template, right? The mRNA now is our template to make a protein in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So if you notice, many times we're going to be seeing movement of things in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction and reading of things in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. So what does this really mean? Basically, when this translocation event happens, we're going to have a new tRNA. This new tRNA is going to go from the A to P site. Goes from the A to the P site. Okay. So imagine you have an A, the EPA sites. Okay. So we have E, P, and A, and we need to start this translocation process. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a ready charged up to amino acid right here in the tRNA A site, and it's going to move from the A to the P site. Once it's done that, once it's moved from A to P, okay, this new one, we're going to now can technically have an empty A site, right, because we've gone from A to P. What's going to happen at the empty A site? So um, actually, what we want to first talk about is this P site. When we move from A to P, we actually have to move away the one that's already in the P site. There's going to be a tRNA in the P site that has to be pushed away because it's already been used. What I mean by this is that, um, I know this is tough to sort of visualize, but think about it like this. An empty, uncharged P, okay, an empty, uncharged P, uh, tRNA, excuse me, tRNA in P site, so tRNA, in the P site, because if it's in the P site, it's been already used, okay? Empty, uncharged P goes to E, okay? Why is it going to E? Because the E is going to be the place at which it is exiting. It's going to be released and recycled at the E site. Released and recycled back into the cytosol. Okay. What are we talking about? What is being released and recycled? The empty, uncharged, meaning that no longer carrying an amino acid, um, tRNA molecule will go from the P site to the E site and be released and recycled. Now we have an empty P site. That empty P site will be filled by this first statement. New tRNA goes from A to P site once the empty one leaves. So we've done that. What's next? Well, now we have an empty A site because the one that from the A went to the P, the one from the P went to the E. Now we have to figure out what do we do with that empty A site. At the empty A site, we have the mRNA specifically. mRNA moves and loads, okay, moves and loads next tRNA anticodon at A, okay, tRNA anticodon at A. So the A site is empty, makes sense for some translocation to happen. Um, I know I said ribosome moves here, but it's more of a combination event in which the ribosome and the mRNA both sort of push themselves a little bit more so that we can read the next part of the reading frame, right, of course, and get something in the A site. Now everything is filled, and now we've gone through this process again and again and again. We'll keep on doing these steps over here continuously until we have a growing polypeptide chain that is of sufficient length. And then finally, we'll end translation by looking very briefly at termination. Termination is the last step of our translation process. In this step, and I forgot to mention one thing, all of these events, these very complex uh, translocated events, are all catalyzed and uh, energized by ATP. So we just want to write that down, energized by ATP. Okay, it's an energy endergonic uh, process that needs energy.
Finally, in termination, we're going to have the uh, inclusion of stop codons. Remember how we talked about stop codons? We're going to now finally apply our knowledge of stop codons. What were the stop codons again? I actually have to look down again, but it's UAA, UAG, and UGA. You would think I've memorized these after how many times I've had to study this, but nonetheless, these are our stop codons, our UAA, UAG, and UGA. These are all codons that are actually not recognized. Remember, they're not recognized by any tRNA molecules, okay? By any tRNA. If you're not recognized by a tRNA molecule, you cannot have an associated amino acid because the amino acids are all carried by tRNAs. If a tRNA doesn't know who you are, you don't have an amino acid to your name. These three codons do not have an amino acid to their name, but what they are recognized by are things called release factors recognized by release factors. And these are critical, critical components to the termination of translation. These release factors, uh, furthermore, can be sort of elaborated on here. And we'll conclude on this final point of release factors. They do a great job. Um, we'll combine with the stop codons, so release factors plus stop codons uh, will uh, happen at the A site. Okay, because let's imagine at the A site right now we have a, uh, let's say, a UAA reading. Once we have a UAA reading from the mRNA transcript at the A site, that is a clear sign that we need release factors. So release factors, so some RF, will come in and bind to this UAA. Once we bind to it, we're going to have the following occur. This binding actually adds H2O, it adds water, not an amino acid to this growing polypeptide chain, okay? So there's no amino acid, but there is water. Why is water coming in? Well, if you know and remember from biological molecules, water is a necessary process, a necessary factor that causes hydrolysis, okay? Hydrolysis, meaning breaking down using water, but between what or of what? This is actually between the polypeptide chain, the one that's done, okay, the one that's, let's say, growing all over here. That polypeptide chain that's growing has to be taken off of that P-site because it's at the P-site. So it causes a hydrolysis between the polypeptide chain and the associated tRNA, the last tRNA in the P-site. And once you've done that hydrolysis, this is actually going to cause the following releases, the following releasing of the polypeptide chain being released, okay? That's released from the poly, from the P site. Then we have the release of the mRNA, I think. Yes, then mRNA. So it's in this order. Polypeptide chain is released. Then mRNA re is released. Then tRNA is released. So it's sort of a domino effect that happens. This is all because of the release factors combining and adding a water molecule causing hydrolysis. And then finally we have the subunits will officially separate completely. They will disassociate. That's a good term. So subunits separate and you can also write down disassociate if you want, if you have more room over here. So overall, we've now completed translation. Just one final thing I want to mention about translation in regards to transcription and also in regards to DNA synthesis is the following. We've gone through a lot of information, but just understand the overall themes of the following three things. Replication, DNA replication specifically, was simply when we went from one DNA molecule to two DNA molecules. Nothing crazy there, two DNA molecules. Let me rewrite that. We went from one DNA molecule to two DNA molecules. That's replication, very simple. We had all those polymerase enzymes, all those key players in replication. What about transcription, which is what we went over in this gene expression lecture? Transcription is when we take one part of the DNA, one part of the DNA, basically a gene, right? And we transcribe it. We turn it into RNA. That's the overall goal of transcription, taking just one part. Replication is taking the whole DNA molecule and just doubling it. Transcription is taking one part of the DNA and turning it into a relevant RNA molecule. What was the purpose of that? The purpose of that was to input it into translation, which would be when we take mRNA, but specifically I want to say mRNA info. I think that's a good way to 
recognize this. Take the mRNA language, the codons, the words that the mRNA tells the ribosome and the tRNA, and turn that into a viable and functioning protein. A polypeptide chain will eventually turn into a protein through many different complex post-translational modifications. Um, overall, hopefully you have a better understanding of gene expression. It's a complex, very complex process of transcription and translation 